Hello, everyone, and welcome to Handmade Hero, show where we code a complete game live on stream. Oh, did this... So, question, I guess we have... Did they start the thing where you have to pass authentication to the... To the... Um, to Twitch now? Or they fall... Because they said they were going to, and I guess they did. What I noticed is on their website, they actually pass undefined. Like, literally the word undefined. Uh for their for the actual like authentication key so i'm wondering if i can update this is this is why so twitch basically broke this for us they've broken it so many times because they keep changing their api for no reason whatsoever uh and they did it one more time so now it requires um oauth tokens to actually uh ask basic questions like whether a stream is live because you know you wouldn't want someone to know whether your stream is live it's not like you can just go to twitch tv slash handmade hero and search for the <clears throat> the word or the little live token, which is literally what you can do if you wanted to scrape the website, but doesn't matter. Point being, uh, I'll probably have to update this, but for now, um, it will still be accurate. It just it'll say live soon instead of actually changing this to uh, the live view. But you should be able to click on the Twitch uh, button here and and you know and go there. So anyway. Uh, what we're going to do today is take a look at, um, we're sort of going to start almost a little bit uh, early. We're going to start our lighting quality work. And the reason that we're going to be doing that today is because we took a pretty close look at the Raycaster. Um, and we debugged the new grid Raycaster pretty thoroughly. And I would say I was relatively confident after looking at the debug visualizations of it that the actual ray casting anyway is a okay like it, it didn't look like there were any problems with the ray casting so the next step is we now have to work on light transport so once we have a ray cast from one place to another we need to make sure that we're actually correctly producing values that make sense in the system and the problem that we have if we want to go that step is that we never actually have done a lighting quality pass in the first place, so we don't actually know one way or the other what should really be happening, right? Meaning ray casting is is the kind of nice part of the process, even though it's obviously very expensive and it's taken us a long time to figure out how we're going to handle it properly. Um, so it's difficult to implement something fast, but it's not difficult to see if it works because you can literally just draw the ray cast and see if it does what you intuitively know it will do, which is shoot in a direction till it hits the first thing and stop there and produce the correct normal for the surface that it hits. And we drew that and we did watch watch it work properly. So we more or less know that that's working. And there's a couple things we can do today to try to verify that we didn't miss anything. And specifically what I mean by that is we didn't do any testing to ensure that the ray results flow out because there's four rays cast at a time. We didn't actually verify that like all four get written to the right place or things like that. So there are a few things that um, have to do uh, with the exit condition. And I guess what I would say is we can go verify just that part um, as a separate exercise because we don't really know about that. But beyond that, the problem that we're going to have is if we would like to take the next step and get the lighting working nice um, and try to finalize it, we need to start building an understanding of what we actually consider to be the correct results. Meaning, at the moment, we don't really have any definition of what we expect this thing to produce. So what I would like to do is I would like to focus primarily on building a better understanding of what we actually think the lighting should produce in terms of values, possibly start assigning some meaning to our values. So, you know, right now we're just kind of bouncing around arbitrary quantities. We don't have any kind of rigid definition for what they are. And in order to finalize the lighting, we're going to have to start having an actual understanding of what those things are. And the reason that I say that is just because if you think about how we're going to debug this, well, there's only really two ways to debug this. One is to just keep messing with it until we get lighting that sort of seems to work right. Right? I mean, for lack of a better term, that's one way we could do it. 
We look at the screen, it looks buggy or doesn't look right. We try to figure out what might be causing that and we go make some changes and then we try to see if that looks better. You know what I'm saying? And that's just kind of a, a bit fraught with peril. It usually leads into situations where the lighting will work okay in certain circumstances and not okay in others. And then you're constantly in this like chasing your tail kind of pattern, you know? So the other way we can do it, and the way that I'd like to try first, is to actually assign some meaning. And it doesn't have to be physical. It doesn't have to be actually real, like from the real physics of light in any way. It can be made up if we want it to be. But we can assign some, like, uh, at least pseudo... I don't want to say pseudoscientific. We can create our own definition of how we expect the light to behave and then we can validate against that meaning we can debug with the expectation that the system should produce those results and that's much easier because if we can come to a concrete definition of what we expect the lighting to do that's way better for us because at that point we can debug individual pieces of it right? We can look at something and say, well, we, we said that the way that this light should behave when it uh, does a diffuse reflection off a surface or something, right, is that it should do X. And if we go look at that part of the routine and it's not doing X, then we know that that's a bug that we can look at independently of the rest of the system. Whereas if we take the first approach, where the only thing that tells us whether it's working properly is whether we like the results, it's really difficult to pinpoint what part of the routine is working poorly because they're all interconnected at that point. Each part, you know, okay, so is the reflectance function working right and the diffuse blur is too dim or is the reflection function too dim and the diffuse blur is fine, right? Like, if all you're looking at are the final intensities that come out of the system, there's many places where those intensities are modified and you don't have any real way of talking about who is operating incorrectly and who is operating correctly. And you're just left with kind of a giant soup of variables that you have to tune and not really ever knowing if you have bugs in there because maybe you do, maybe you don't, right? So... <clears throat> So what I'd like to do is move forward on that. Uh, and that's going to be a little bit difficult because it's it's really not um, it's really not something that I uh, do particularly often. I don't work with light as much as I would probably like. I, I probably should have spent more time at some point in my career. Uh, but because I was working on character animation a lot of the time and rendering was really done uh, sort of external to me, I never really got... Um, a lot of experience with lighting functions and it's a bummer because you know it means that I'm just not good with them and a lot of the things that I should know um, cold I just don't know so um, as you can see we currently have the ability to this is a ray cast here we currently have the ability actually to step through rays uh, as we wish let me see what is it f2 probably no f3 so um, one of the things that you can see here is that if I, you know, roll this around, I can actually change like where the lighting is, is actually getting positioned. And I can also sort of change which ray is being shot out of it. And so you can see here, we can debug the ray caster pretty trivially. And this is what I was talking about before. So you can see here, the ray is getting shot towards this, um, towards this cube here. And it's hitting the cube, and you can see the normal is coming back uh, exactly as we expect. And so for light transport, we kind of know, at least to a certain extent, um, we know that it's working because we can, or, I'm sorry, not for light transport, for ray casting. We kind of know that it's working because we can see where the ray is hitting. You know, it's there's a little white box there as well. And you can see the, the back you know, the the sort of like uh, normal that's gonna, the splashing back from the hit. And you can see the ray target uh, uh, from, you know, where, where it was and where it went, right? And you can even see the grid squares that it, you know, marched along the way. And so I guess, you know, short of the, 
fact that I'm probably going to want to go in and do one more optimization pass on this Raycaster, you know, there it, it seems like we did our job, right? So it's like it's producing the correct results in the Raycast. So now what we need to know is like what should be happening on that transfer. And if we look, um, if we look at uh, the speed for compute light propagation as well, um, you know, we again are not far from where we need to be target wise. And I think we have a lot of opportunity to optimize this particular routine um, because it has a lot more control than the old tree walk did. Um, and there's things we can do that we haven't done yet that we probably should as well, like making these grid squares larger. Because if we, for example, stopped doing the pre-computation um, of the walk table and rolled the walk table walk into the actual raycast, we could also do some interesting things there where we actually have our grid squares be much larger than the, um, than the underlying geometry to bucket up a few more of uh, things per cell, which I think would accelerate this routine dramatically. So I feel like we've got a lot of, of headway on that. So I think we're gonna be able to get down to our 16 millisecond budget there. Um, I think that's entirely within reason. So uh, I wanna just put that aside for now and focus on what happens at this point. So we have a cell, we have a hit, and the question is, how do we know what kind of energy gets transferred from here to here, right? And I think the biggest challenge for me and the reason why, I, like I said, I don't really know exactly <clears throat> uh, how to approach this, it's a bit tough, is that how do we visualize that in a way that makes it intuitive as to whether it's doing what we expect, right? <clears throat> because if you if you look at how we debugged the ray casting, that went really fast, right? Remember, we had a completely busted ray tracer, and in like you know four hours or something total debug time. I don't remember how much it was. It wasn't much. <clears throat> We fixed like, you know, 12 bugs in it or something. It was it was just rapid. You know, every 10 minutes we found and fixed a bug. And every single one of them, right, was because we could see it. We could see what was supposed to happen and it was just obvious what was wrong. You were just like, oh, okay. It's, you know, it's not walking in the right direction. So let's go look at the walk, you know, thing. Where, you know, how would this be happening, right? <clears throat> Saying it's obvious what was wrong is a little bit, it's obvious where the bug is, right? You don't necessarily know what the bug is till we go look at the code and try to debug it, but you know where the bug is. But I don't know what would be a good way to visualize the uh, underlying lighting in a way that makes it so that I can tell how this light transfer should be working, right? That's the problem. So, you know, when I look at what's going on in, you know, in this system, it's like, how do I figure out, how do I give myself something to hold on to where I can start to narrow in on, like, how this lighting transfer should work, right? <clears throat> and so my, my only real idea at this point um, is to think, could I do something where I draw like some kind of, some kind of like, sp I'm tr trying to think of how to describe this. Imagine almost like we took the octahedral map <clears throat> and the octahedral map is 64 directions, right? If I took at each center of each grid square, right? And I drew a line out through the center of each of those octahedral maps, map uh, pixels. And I just drew it so that it was like getting longer, the brighter it was in that direction. So the value stored in the octahedral map at that point 
is what would uh, is what would tell me how that was being transferred, right? So I'm just thinking if I started there and uh, granted again, like I don't, I haven't started on the, the concept of trying to find these quantities, but if I started there, then I would at least have something where each of my voxel cells would be showing me something that I could use to intuit how on each step the light was getting propagated. And the other thing that I think I could do once I put that in that might help is I could bind like a key on the keyboard to stepping the lighting. So rather, like right now what happens is I run the lighting and it's just running. Like so it's constantly feeding back, right? And right now we kind of have this problem that it massively, it produces massively too bright uh, information. But, you know, if I go into the, the lighting code, there's actually um, in the build diffuse uh, maps here. So we can actually artificially like really dampen the diffuse blur, uh, which again, we have, we have not actually worked out what those equations should be. So who knows? We don't know what the right value is here um, anyway. But uh, you can watch, see how slowly over time the lighting kind of blossoms out like that. Like that's what's actually happening when you run it slowly, when you run the update slowly. What I could do is I could step the lighting kind of one at a time and I could look to see what's going on there, right? So so where are these lighting transfers happening and how is that spread occurring, right? And again, that's just to give me some intuition of whether, you know, whether it's just a question of not having the math right under the hood so maybe we're doing the right things but with the wrong coefficients or whether it runs deeper than that. And actually there are bugs in the propagation that's causing it to get over bright actually that have, that have nothing to do with the coefficients or how we're computing the light. And so that's my thinking, right? Um, and as you can see, there's really no value you can set that produces a correct result here. So it's not like we just have one coefficient wrong anyway, because at the outset, the light's not propagating at all, right? And then it kind of like hits a critical threshold and just <laughs> propagates out to, to Fulbright. So there's definitely a feedback loop in there, but I feel like to get a handle on what that feedback loop actually is, I just feel like I need more information. So when we actually run um, and we, uh, we sort of look at what we're getting here for results, what I'd like to do uh, as well is because the lighting grid is, is fairly substantial, like the, the number of cells in the voxel lighting grid is, is, you know, it's, I don't know, 16 by 16 by 24. It's not infinite by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a lot to draw. So if I were to look at all, you know, each one of these little cubes in the entire 3D um, volume here, they would all have one of those little octahedral map blossoms on them. And that is gonna to be too much, right? It's just, I, I, it's just too much. I won't be able to actually process that amount of visual information. So what I might also do while I'm doing that particular pass over the um, system for debugging is I might also introduce a box that's just, look, we're just gonna look at the lighting in a small region, right? Um, and there's two ways I could do that. One is I can actually shrink the size of the lighting voxel. Uh, but the other, which is probably what I'll do instead, is I'll just introduce a secondary bounds. And it's just like, because I've done this before uh, on stream, you've seen me do it for the lighting system. Instead of actually producing any kind of uh, debug information for all the cells, I'll just produce it for just those ones inside the box. And if that turns out not to give me the insight I need, we'll figure something else out, I guess. But that's what I, I want to start with. So if we take a look at um, the push lining render values, what you can see is we already have the push line segment for debug lines in here. So what I can do is I really have two options. One is I can actually draw line segments here and not take up any debug lines. And that might be a better solution because there's really no reason that I need to do it 
earlier on in the pipeline. So, you know, maybe instead of using the debug line call, I'll just do this, right? I'll, I'll, just, I'll just push them here. Oh, well, although, you know what? It helps because it tells the renderer how much I need. So maybe I will use the debug lines because that would that maybe be a little more convenient. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is after we're done computing the lighting, so once we're done, once we do update lighting, um, maybe I'll just make a function call for this, uh, just, just period. So after the internal lighting core, core runs, um, I'll just call the thing that's like, uh, you know, debug draw octahedral values. And in this particular case, I guess I will need the spec atlas and diffuse, diffuse atlases. Um, I think I probably want to find a way to draw both of them, would be my guess. Um, yeah. So one of the things that it occurs to me as well, um, just in terms of the way we're doing things. So the way the diffuse blur works right now doesn't really make any sense, right? Because uh, it's it's probably providing too much power to the system because you're basically saying, look, uh, we're not actually we're not actually reducing the reflected power of this thing when you know if you imagine a hundred photons came in on in this direction. And now we're basically saying that 100 photons also go out in all the directions only modulated by the cosine, right? And while that makes sense for a single bounce integration, if you were doing it that way, it doesn't actually work, prob I, I would think, for stored values, right? Because the diffuse uh, values that we're then going to use are going to be sampled on the next frame. And I'm assuming that the, the feedback loop has a lot to do with that, right? Um, again, I just want to draw it first before I draw any conclusions, but you can you can kind of see why that's a little bit dicey. Like we haven't thought that through because we haven't started to work on lighting quality yet, but there's definitely like an, an element of that that's just, you know, it makes me nervous, right? Um, and, uh, and th this system has a property that others, the other ray tracer didn't have, which is that in this system, one thing that we do is if we early out, we pull from whatever cell we earlyed out in and we put, we take that like quantity. And so that creates a possible reliance in this system on the diffuse map being power correct uh, that wasn't in the previous system, right? The previous system was never going to do that. It only would transfer if it actually hits something. Uh, and so there are differences there that are important to understand, right? So if I loop through the uh, the actual, uh, oct the, uh, the voxel, so if I loop through the voxel here and I just uh, say I'm going to, like I said, define a particular narrower region inside the voxel. And I'm not sure how I really want to do that, but maybe what I'll do is I'll just take a predefined ratio of the thing. So if normally it would be a certain dimension, I'll d divide that dimension by four or something, right? So I can say like, all right, the, you know, the number of cells that I want to loop over for this. And if we look at the light atlas, you can see that it actually has um, a V3S in here, right, for the dimension. So I can just say uh, the debug dimension is going to be the spec atlas voxel dim. And what I can do is just say we're only going to use uh, a subset of that. So, you know, maybe we use only um, a quarter of the total voxel space, right? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, that, well, the start, uh, you know, the, the the voxel start area or whatever is going to be the debug dim. Um, and times two would be the center. So maybe we'll just do like, uh, right, because if we divide by four, we have a quarter of the space. And so what I'd like to do is move it up by one and a half of itself, right? Uh, so what I want to do here is say like, look, let's do debug dim times three over four or something. 
right? Uh, something like that. <clears throat> oh, sorry. No. Uh, like that. So basically, we are moving it up by one and a half of itself. Uh, and that will give us a roughly centered one. So we're just going to pick out like the qu a quarter uh, in each dimension in the middle of the voxel. And then all I'm going to do here is I'm not even going to try to, to draw this first time. I'm just going to try and isolate the area. Uh, in fact, I could just do a debug box call for now. Um, push debug box. And that will give me uh, just just a way of figuring out whether I'm drawing in the right place. So in order to iterate over this, uh, I'll just do the standard, you know, uh, Z first. And I guess I can do it this way. I'll just do a standard Z, Y, X iteration. Again, one of those things that C kind of makes it annoying to write. You would like that to be way more automatic, but it's actually fairly hard to do those in C and C++. Uh, they're not, not particularly great languages. But then again, what is? Um, so if we go to the actual coordinate we want to draw, it's just going to be the vox start uh, plus you know this, this x, y, z. So at that point, we have where we are in the voxel. And like we know, because we actually have uh, the voxel system here, uh, <clears throat> we know we have calls we can use uh, to produce these. But unfortunately, we don't actually have this uh, set up for the, the spec atlas, right? Um, if you remember, if you go back to the spec atlas, you can see uh, we, we don't actually store any of that information. Um, so what we kind of need to do is we need to borrow, um, and I guess we actually already did this, so I suppose I should have just used it a little bit more directly. Um, in fact, if I just do uh, voxel grid here, we actually have the lighting grid. I don't know if you remember this, but we actually did already <clears throat> make one. So the atlas grid is the one that is lined up with the spec atlas. So we can actually use uh, the atlas grid here to do uh, our dirty work for us. So if we go to handmade voxel, I can get the cell bounds here. And I can just say, look, give me the cell bounds of this uh, atlas, right? I can also do this, which is probably more what I want because I actually only just want the centers. But what I'm gonna do uh, just to make sure that I'm doing what I think I'm doing is I'm actually gonna ask for both of these I'm going to ask for the Atlas grid uh, to give us uh, both the center and the bounds. And then I'm going to push two debug boxes on. Uh, the first one I'm going to push on is going to be the bounds. Uh, and I'll do that in like a dark blue. I don't know why. I just will. Um, we could do a dark red. Uh, and then I'm going to push the center P on uh, and I'm going to do that in a bright red. And what I need to do here is because I, I do want to push a debug box specifically, um, I'm going to just take the center P and I'm going to do uh, a, a rect uh, center dim where I just say that's where I want the box to be centered, and then I want the dimension of the box to be, you know, something, who knows what. Let's say it's that. Um, and this will give me just something uh, that I can use. It looks like I don't have operators for the V3S for some reason, uh, which I will fix right now. So here's the V3S, and uh, we've, Oh, nope, that's not what I wanted. Here's where we actually define the operators for the V3S. And those are the V2s. Uh, these are the V3s. Here are the V3Ss. Uh, and I guess we must have, I'm assuming we at least did uh, add for it. But, you know, honestly, I don't actually see it. So we may have just not done any operators for these at all. 
have a lot of math in this game that we've built up. Here we go. So, you know, we've got, um, we've got multiply by a constant on one side, but not the other side. Uh, and then we have uh, divide on the other side. So we should probably just say, look, you can do this in any order. No one actually cares which order you use. Um, it's totally fine with us. Off we go. So <clears throat> once we've done that, looks like we have, cannot convert to oxal grid. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, once we have that done, we should be able to take a look, and it looks like I've got an issue here. What is the issue? Um, syntax error. Did I put one too many? I did. Um, so once we've got that, we should be able to now see like just a bunch of boxes showing the region uh, that this will cover. And so there's the region, and you can see it pretty clearly. Um, and so, you know, it looks about right, um, I would say. You can see here that it lines up perfectly with the interior boxes, which is what it should do, right? You can see they overlap pretty much exactly. Um, and so this should give me a way to, uh, to now figure out what the heck is going on there. So if I go ahead and remove one of these boxes, so rather than getting the cell bounds here, um, I mean, maybe I still will, but I'm just not going to draw them. What I want to do now is I want to draw lines coming out uh, of the uh, of that center point. I want to draw them based on the intensity that is seen uh, at the in the spec atlas at that texel. And <clears throat> I probably need to draw both the spec atlas and the diffuse atlas, or at least be able to look at either of them. And I don't really know that I'm going to be able to draw them both very effectively. Um, I mean, I might be able to get away with drawing the diffuse atlas first and the spec atlas on top of it. Because the spec atlas should always, at the way we're doing it right now, the spec atlas will actually generally be have less stuff in it, right? Because the Fuse Atlas is always going to be sort of like a spread out version that has more cells filled in. And so... Yeah. So I guess I would say, yeah, like, let's just try them both, I guess. So if I go over to the light atlas, um, what you can see here is we've got sort of the, the tile dim uh, system, right? And I also have the, the they're inside the octahedral uh, stuff for the math. Well, actually, is it in here? <clears throat> um, let's, uh, let's take a look. So yeah, in here, what we want to do is go ahead and, and grab uh, the actual, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to loop over this and just say, look, we're going to go through uh, all the texels in this thing that we care about. So not the edge texels because they're only used in blending. So we probably don't want to draw those because where would we draw them? They don't have a, an obvious, uh, an obvious place where they would be they don't have like a place to be drawn they're just used for wrapping around and they really just represent copies of things anyway so um <clears throat> so here where we have unit vector from octahedral i'm guessing that <clears throat> really what we need is more of this right um, because we need it to account for the fact that, yeah, we're, we're looking at a particular one. We could also, nah, I mean, I think we want to use this one. So what we want to do here is say, yeah, give us the direction from this TX, TY. So there's our TX and TY. And then we want to pass the correct coefficient. So in this case, we're talking about the spec atlas. Um, and it's got the, 
It's the octim coefficient, right? No, it's the OXY coefficient. So we want to pass the OXY coefficient, and that will give us back the direction in the world, right? So that's the direction that we actually want to draw. <clears throat> and so now we just need to get that value from the light atlas, right? So we need to have a way in here that we can access the atlas. Um, like we need a way to actually access the value uh, that's stored there. And you can see here, if we do light atlas offset with an X, Y, Z, a T, X, and T, Y, we should just be able to get what the actual displacement would be off of the main value. And there may be, um, I was gonna say there may be a way we already do that, but I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so we might wanna have a, a thing that just does a sample. So we may wanna have a thing here that we could use that just samples from the map. Um, and we don't really have one of those at the moment. So something that's like, well, I, you know what? I guess get tile clamped does, right? Um, <clears throat> I guess that's what we would want. So if we do get tile clamped, that'll bring us back a texel. Uh, there's our spec atlas. We know our X, our Y, our Z, and our TX and TY. Uh, and so we don't really need it to be clamped. Uh, I guess, yeah, so we could just do this. We even had that. So I guess we did have all this already. Um, and that should give us back the texel, right? And a texel in this case is uh, a I guess it just gives us back a pointer to the yeah. So never mind. It gives us back a it gives us back a texel by just pointing to where in the map this thing actually is, right? So at that point, we now know the R, the G, and the B. <clears throat> so what we can do is we can just draw the intensity at this point, for example. So what we could do is say, well, let's just draw the intensity. Maybe what we'll do is we'll take the R plus the G, you know, plus the B right um and we'll just call that the general intensity right for no real reason and then we'll draw a vector that's that long so we'll do push debug line we know the direction we'll multiply the intensity by the direction and we'll have a scale factor in there right and we don't know what that scale factor is but you know it's something um so we'll have a scale factor times the intensity times the direction and we'll just offset from whatever the center P is. Um, we can also draw this with the actual color that it is. So for example, we can say that it'll just be, uh, that was it 2v4? Or is it just v4? So we'll just say draw it as the color um, so that we can see what color is actually there as well. Now at the moment, we're not really using colored lighting. Um, the light that we put in the scene is white and most of the reflectors are, you know, kind of just dim gray or something. So there's not really, we're not playing with colored reflectors yet. We do want to, uh, we just haven't done that yet. And oops, I forgot to actually pull out the value. And so what I want to do there is just, you know, again, start to see what's going on with these lighting intensities. Um, that's a dot operator. <clears throat> Push to the line does not take three arguments. I believe you. There we go. And too many parentheses again. Today is kind of a too many parentheses day, I guess. Okay. Um, so running this now, uh, well, you know, it looks exactly like what you would expect, right? Um, which is kind of good, I guess, meaning it does clearly let us see what's going on in the system is not, you know, there's nothing strange about what's going on in the system. We are literally just getting, um, a slow accretion of omnidirectional light over time, 
right? I mean, you look at that and it's just like everything is getting larger slowly. And then we are over the, when we get over the value one, we start to sparkle. We need to probably clamp this down, right? Um, so inside push debug line, we should probably be clamping these. So when we put this color in here, like we should be clamping those, right? Um, or we should do it later. It doesn't really matter when exactly we do it, right? Uh, but like maybe back down here where we're actually gonna do the push line segment uh, and we do, you know, In here, what we do is we do an RGBA a, a pack four by eight. Um, so before we hit that pack, we really will have wanted to do a min max on this, right? So <clears throat> in here, uh, what we wanna do is we wanna do a like V4 color equals uh, minimum. Uh, I don't know if we have Yeah, we do. So we have one, well, we have one for V3s. I don't know if we have one for V4s. Uh, but what we wanna do here is like make a min uh, that will basically prevent these things, right? From overflowing. So I'm not sure what we called this last parameter. Um, or if we called it anything, it's a good question. <clears throat> no, we didn't, did we? Oh, we did, we called it W. All right, I was wondering if we did. Cause I know we had an issue where um, UVW versus XYZW, you know? Um, I remember that from way back when. All right, so, <clears throat> if we have a min max for this, uh, we can now just drop that in here for our, you know, for our V4s. And we should now be able to clamp those lighting values. And we don't really need to do this, um, but you know, I just felt like we should. So I wanna take the minimum uh, and the maximum value here to clamp these out so that we're never getting uh, below uh, oh, wow, all right. Looks like we already had clamp zero one. Waste of everyone's time. There we go. So I'm gonna clamp zero one, the color value there. And that way you'll see as these things get larger uh, during the light propagation phase. Uh, now, hopefully we can get these so that they just stay white, right? Famous last words, which they don't. Now, why would that be? I'm not sure why they would sparkle. <clears throat> hmm. That's awfully confusing. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. Might want to actually use the color that we computed. It turns out that if you want to succeed in the game industry, you have to use the color value you computed. So let's take a look now. Well, it's a little better, but it still actually seems to have weird fluctuation there in color values. I'm not sure why we would be getting that. So I'd like to take a look at that. <clears throat> that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, oh, I see, because we had two of them, I guess. I guess you can define the endpoints. All right, so uh, that all looks good. Um, and you can just see, so these things, things just grow without bound, right? So, you know, um, I think the next thing I would like to do is I would like to be able to, uh, I'd like to be able to step this in a more controlled fashion so I want the lighting system perhaps to only update itself when I like tell it to, you know? <clears throat> <Yeah. clears throat> 
So I'm not sure exactly what I should do here um, to do that exactly, but I guess all I really need to do is if you never call update lighting, So in here, <clears throat> if we never call update lighting, uh, then we won't have a problem, I don't think. So we do have a slight issue, which is we'd like to be able to push the lighting render values, but I'm not sure we can do that if we've never updated the lighting. So we may have to add some guards to prevent it from crashing in the because uh, it will never have like allocated anything, but we'll see. So if we have an if zero here, we should get no lighting now, but we may also miss some values. Yeah. Um, so in this case, like we haven't actually initialized the lighting, it's never been called. If we make this contingent on like pressing a key, for example, uh, that would probably be sufficient. So, not sure how I want to do that. We have the game input. Um, We could do mouse button. I don't know. So, where is mouse button? So, if I do input mouse button here, uh, and we, you know, take the, I don't know, left mouse button. What's the button? What do I use for moving the camera right now? So I guess I use all of them for moving the camera. Um, <clears throat> I guess I could also use an F key press. Maybe I just use F key pressed. So if I use F key pressed and we just, I don't know, bind F9 to it, let's say. Um, then I could just say, look, that, that'll update the lighting one time. I think, right? So here's me like single stepping the lighting, right? And that works real nice. Okay, so now we're in good shape, right? because we can actually go in now and inspect these actual lighting values and you can kind of see what they're doing, right? <clears throat> and what's I think especially interesting about these is it looks like the lighting from the sky is sufficient to overwrite these already. Like you can see how much light is coming from, you know, up above. Right, do you see those kind of growing? And so it's not like they're picking up the light particularly rapidly from these, you know? But then as these start to get that, so it looks like it's largely a moonlight issue at the immediate moment. So let's turn the moonlight off and just see where we're at without the moonlight. Just, let's just start there um, to try and like simplify this problem a little bit uh, as we start to move into trying to define these lighting values. So where does the moonlight actually come into the picture with the grid raycaster? So here's the grid raycaster, and here's the moon. So let's just get rid of this. Um, I'm assuming this is used uh, somewhere here. It is not. Um, so in grid raycast, if I get rid of this, does that mean we're not? Does that mean we're not using this? Yeah, 
So we're actually getting our moon uh, color from somewhere else at the moment. Uh, it looks like it's probably, that's in the AAB caster, which we're not using at the moment. Um, so we're probably getting the moon from some kind of initialization that was happening in here, I'm guessing. Uh, let's see. Uh, wow. Okay, so actually, I'm wrong. So this this must be a bug then, right? Um, so if you look, here's the AAB Raycast, which we're not using. So at the moment, this has no moonlight in it at all. Uh, and yet, it is saying, as I allow this to grow, It is saying that I'm getting a stronger light bounce from above than below, right? Look at that. So, <clears throat> so I don't really know what's going on here, but we we've we've really screwed something up. So. I guess the good news here is we know we've got a bug because there's no light up there. There's only like light in a couple places like here and here and stuff. And so if you were going to find a light, you'd find it over here. And in fact, some of the people seem to have what appear to be semi-sensical results, I guess. I mean, but not really. Um, but you can kind of see, like, there's this strong preference for, like, light that people are finding, like, over here, you know? Um, so I think one thing we probably do want to do is we probably want to draw these lights. Uh, we're not currently drawing the lights right now. We, we probably should. Uh, so we can actually see where they are because we also don't. That's one thing we don't know. So we should put that in here. Um, so here's the push light call, right? And we probably want to do a push cube call uh, off of that. So if I just <clears throat> come down here and do, oh, I could do a push volume outline. Maybe that's better. So inside push light. <clears throat> <clears throat> I tell you, it's brutal. Um, I went to the ENT and they really don't know what's wrong with me, so I don't know. <clears throat> I need one of those Stephen Hawking things he has had, unfortunately. So in here what I'll do is I'll I'll push the volume outline. And I'll take a look at the rectangle. So I have the box min max here, so I'll just do a rect min max. <clears throat> uh, and then we'll just draw we'll just draw it in white, that's fine. We'll just use the default parameters. So if I run now. Um, here's where the lights are, right? And you can see that we just kind of stuck them up above like lamps, I guess, was, you know, we, we've we spent literally zero time on the world gen lighting stuff. Like we just threw a light in above lamps, I think it was what we did, just so we'd have some in there. So if you can see what's going on here, this is where you expect people to be picking light up from, right? Um, would be here, but they're definitely not. And we need to f figure out why. So as we sort of step forward here, see? It's very strange. And we would definitely expect that some, you know, you would getting 
this is where you should be getting more uh, of that light from, but just there's so much light coming from this upper area and I just no explanation for it. Okay, so how are we going to do this? I don't know. Um, so there's a couple things we can do. Um, but first, I guess what I would like to do is shift this guy over to look at one of these, right? Like I'd like this guy to be up a bit. So, you know, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> that's weird. I don't know what that was about. Oh, I know why. It's because the lighting stops having those when you don't actually run it. So what I probably should do actually is those debug values. Um, so in here, uh, I kind of need these to be happening all the time because if they don't, then they don't get updated, right? Uh, for a particular frame. I'm not sure how I would actually go about outputting some of those uh, because they don't always exist, right? Like some of them are only in here. But I guess what I could do is in push render lighting values, I could do the ones that always exist. And so I could do something like this, right? Uh, so here, I could, as we are stepping these, right, um, I could go ahead and roll through where these are. And I guess I have to actually, oh uh, yeah, I have to actually step two to make that happen. That's a pain in the butt. So there's one of them, for example, uh, 17, 9, 12. And I want one that kind of goes upward. Okay, there we go. Um, well, eh, well, is that enough? I don't know if that's enough. Is that enough? That's probably upward enough. 90. Um, Maybe a hundred or ninety, yeah, a hundred. So seventeen, nine, twelve, and a hundred, maybe, you know, uh, would be good debug values. I don't know. Um, what are these? Seventeen, nine, twelve, a hundred, seventeen, nine, twelve, a hundred. And so if I go in here and yeah. There we go. All right. So now whenever I run, I should hopefully uh, get, you know, a pretty good like representative raycast that goes up toward uh, the, the area that we're supposedly getting light. You know what I mean? Why are we above? That seems weird. I guess I need to subtract one grid sheet from it. I should probably also have a way to run this f like several steps at once so I can get to the point where this actually starts to happen, right? So 
So oddly enough, actually, like that direction in particular, I guess, doesn't isn't quite the one we want. It's really a different one. Um, so let's try that one more time. It's really going up in the opposite direction, meaning sort of this but flipped, if that makes sense. So we'd like to see... Uh, we'd like to see... Also, I want this to be... I don't know how this ended up so far out. I guess this whole thing was up too much. Should probably just do this algorithmically. Or, you know what, maybe we should just have a thing where we could pick. If we're gonna be debugging this a lot, it would be, this is way too much of a pain in the butt. We would, Cause it'd be not that hard to make just a thing where you can pick. All right, where the heck is this thing? Okay, where, how do I not see it at all? That doesn't really make sense. There it is. Oh, right, I forgot. A lot of times you won't see it because it's too large. The exterior voxel doesn't get things cast from it. And this is an exterior, vo exterior voxel index, is that right? Sounds right. Sort of right, anyway. Okay, so now we're at least actually on one of the incorrect ones, which I would like. So it's 17, 9, 12. Wait, but that is the one I picked. How did the debug grid index get to be something other than that? Oh, because it's just an offset. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Wow, all right. Um, all right, so that was a complete waste of time. But anyway, uh, so yeah. What we need to do is we need to figure out how to maybe pick a, a grid direction for the actual cast that's gonna go more towards uh, the light that we care about. Uh, and then we need to see like what the heck it's returning. Because like something in that direction is clearly returning uh, a high value for no apparent reason, right? And I don't know. Well, that's not awful. Uh, not quite. So I don't know. I don't actually know, I should th try to figure out what the, the ray indices. I wonder if the ray indices are wrong. So here's a thought. One reason that we could be seeing the directional part of the bug is it could be that our rays are actually going in different directions than the right back location. That could easily be, and we should look at that pretty much right now. Um, I just want to finish finding, there we go. That one's pretty close, would you say? Let me take a look at, let me let these grow again and see if that's a roughly close ray to the direction that's getting the light. Uh, I'm not entirely certain it is, but let's take a look. Okay. So if I zoom in now a little bit more on the uh, on the actual directional system here. Yeah, so that's real close. So I'm gonna call 156 actually a better debug ray index. Okay, so if for example, we were casting in a particular direction um, and then writing back to the wrong uh, part of the octahedral map, that would explain why we were seeing what looks like directional lighting coming into these things, but from a completely different direction than where the light source is, right? Um, 
So that could be, and we should definitely test that. And there's a lot of ways we can test it. So we'll go take a look at some ways, right, that we can use. <clears throat> okay. So here's an example, right? You can see uh, for this particular Well, we set it to 156, but that's that's not that doesn't look right. What am I missing? That wasn't what it was, was it? Or do we does this truncate? Was it 155? Oh, so I guess it doesn't round it truncates. All right, so I take it back. It's 155. All right. So we can debug that one specifically, and we will. But what I'd like to do first is, I think it'd probably be a better idea to go and look before we go any further to see whether we're writing back to the correct place. So if I go to uh, grid raycast and just look and see when we're doing our debugging, uh, and so this function will have the debug augmentation added to it, I'd like to try to discuss uh, who the heck is getting written back to, right? So in other words, in here, uh, when we're doing our, our store, you know, who's actually getting stored. Uh, to be fair, with if debugging was on, um, we probably shouldn't be writing back to a Texel. I hope the debug system itself is not causing this problem, but could that be? I don't think that could be, but anyway. Um, so what I'd like to do here is when we do this debug, uh, I'd like to figure out which spec Texel we're writing to uh, and draw that, right? So in here, we're going to say, look, here's the spec atlas and whether we're debugging. When we call that grid raycast, I want to do a, uh, I want to do something that draws where it, what direction we thought it should be. <laughs> so inside full cast, which is here, uh, if we are going to be doing the debug, which is this one, when we get these texels, uh, what I would like to see, <sighs> well, this is gonna be harder. So the problem is we kind of just randomly write to it arbitrary location here, right? Um, which we don't really want to do. Like, this is not a good thing that we've done here. Um, I also don't know why there's a spec Texel B because we don't use it, so I'm not sure why we have that, right? Um, the actual code should be this. But just to make sure, what I want to do here is say, okay, the spec Texel A that you're writing to can see um, in here it just it just writes to it I'm gonna go ahead and just create a dummy buffer so that we don't that this can't be affecting us so here's a dummy buffer and I'm not gonna do this offset from Texel what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna say there's a spec Texel uh, and it points to this and that's it <clears throat> so now Hopefully, when someone writes to this spec Texel, um, it'll just be ignored. No one, you know, it won't, it won't do anything. So if I run it now, I'm assuming that that wasn't the problem, but I want to make sure, right? I want to make sure that, that we don't have some other bug in here um, where the debug system is, is actually causing a problem. I don't think it could, uh, but just to make sure. And yeah, so it wasn't the debug system. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, so you can see here, <clears throat> still the same problem. And there's an example of a cast. That cast is producing, you know, probably light that it shouldn't. Okay. So now what we need to do is add some kind of debug augmentation in here 
where we actually determine where this thing is coming from and try to ver verify that we're casting in the correct direction. Um, I think the way we would want to do that is if we look at the debug ray index here, um, I guess we just have to figure out how we would have pulled out the ray origin for, I mean, the ray direction for that thing and see what we do. So here's our example. We take the sample dir here and so this this is how it would have been computed. So we have a particular octahedron index. Excuse me. <clears throat> so you have a specific octahedron index here. And what we want to be able to do is reverse engineer what that would have been. So here's our debug ray index, right? Which was rounded, so that was weird that that was not, yeah, that was weird. But anyway, if we go ahead and take our uh, debug der index, or I should say debug ray index, so if we take our debug ray index, and now we want to reverse engineer what these values would have been. So we want to know what octahedron it would have been. What we can do is just divide by the light sample directions per octahedron. So the debug oct index is actually going to be this. Uh, and then the debug, uh, I guess I don't know what we would call this, but inside the octahedron, We'd, I guess we'd call this the, the map index, um, is just gonna be the remainder. In fact, I could just do the mod here. So this is which octahedron we were looking in. This is which map we were looking in. And so now uh, what we wanna know is what direction do we think that should have been, right? And you can see here how we were looping through it. So we're going through SY, and then for SY, we're going through uh, the, the texels one, two, three, four, right? So what we would expect to see here is if we got the map index, we now need to know what our TX and TY were, and those are gonna be found exactly the same way. So the map index divided by eight would be the Y, and the mod eight would be the X, right? <clears throat> Looking in here at the spec texel, uh, at that point, we just have to uh, figure out where we get the, uh, well, actually, you know what? We don't really care about this. Uh, all we really need to do is say, look, that's gonna give us the TX and the TY value uh, that are on offset. In fact, these are actually the, like the octahedral because they don't include the border, right? So we should be able to look up directly into the octahedral map for those. Uh, so in here, where we would call unit vector from octahedral, that's all we should really need. Now, I want to, I, I mean, maybe I should call direction from TXTY and just make sure that we're doing everything correctly. Um, and if I want to do that, then I just have to add one to each of these to account for the border, right? So that's all well and good. And since this is the spec atlas that we're talking about here, it'd be the spec atlas of XY coefficient in question, although the atlases happen to be the same dimension right now, so it wouldn't matter. Um, but this will give us a way of figuring out what direction this goes in. So this is like our expected direction. And what I can do then is I can, after the grid raycast, I can push a line segment uh, that basically says, wherever the ray origin was, right? Draw something coming out that's the expected direction and we'll do like, you know, uh, ray origin single plus that um, in a color that I can see really clearly. So, 
you know, maybe, uh, maybe magenta. And this way I can see what direction we expect this ray to roughly be in. Uh, and then we can, um, we can take, uh, we can see whether or not the rays are going in the rough direction that we expect them to, right? Uh, that's supposed to be capitalized. And push debug line is actually what I wanted, yeah. And uh, I think that should give us a little bit of insight into whether we've got these things lined up right. So let's take a look at the debug system now. And all I'm gonna do is perturb that ray index, right? It looks pretty good. I mean, these octahedral maps are pretty low res, so you're only expecting them to be roughly in line, like they're not gonna be exact, um, right? So uh, I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't call that suspicious. Yeah, it. It's pretty close. So. <clears throat> so I would call that pretty reliable. Like that doesn't look uh, like an issue. Now. Uh, that doesn't tell us anything about the sampling from the octahedral map, but it does look like we're writing back into the right location. So at that point, my question just becomes, all right, let's take a look at this Raycast. Um, specifically, you know, and, and I'm gonna tr crank up that, uh, that value again so that the single steps are very large. Uh, so where we do build diffuse light maps, um, I'm gonna let those get large quickly. So um, here's more of a aggressive spreading parameter there. And here is the first lighting step. Oops. I guess I don't need this up. I feel like I want to be able to see those early steps more easily, so maybe I should also just make them a bit larger. So where we draw the lines, uh, maybe I will try to, well, but even that doesn't really make sense. It's weird that we're getting that, getting so much light from such small values in, even initially because one unit is one meter. Like one unit is pretty far, right? Oh, but I put a scale value in. Okay, so did I put a scale value in there? I think I did. Intensity times scale, I think I did, right? Yeah. So let's just leave that at one then for now, uh, and we'll see what happens there. Uh, although it's still, that's still, yeah. I feel like So right now, there should be like, how are we getting that much light, like visible light from such tiny values? That just doesn't make sense, does it? All right. <clears throat> So this is only the spec atlas. Let's get both of them. So I'm gonna get both of these. Uh, and then what I wanna do is in here, I wanna do a spec value and a diffuse value. And then what I wanna do is <clears throat> I want to do a spec intensity and a diffuse intensity. Uh, 
And actually, maybe I'll just do this. So maybe we'll just say, look, um, <clears throat> this process here, uh, we can just abstract. We just won't tell you what Atlas it is. Um, you'll go ahead and get it. I don't know which these are. Get tile unclamped. They're S's. So you'll just say that. Um, and then this will just happen automatically for you. So you'll get the value. It'll compute the intensity. Uh, and that's it. <clears throat> So here I'm going to say debug draw color dir. I'm going to pass the spec atlas for that one. I'll need the lighting solution and the center P. And then I'll do the same thing for the diffuse atlas. And the problem here that I'm going to have is I'm not going to be able to tell the two apart, right? Uh, so we're going to have to come up with some way of differentiating the two. And I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. Um, that's that's uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> all right. So I think that's all good, and. So you can see the diffuse atlas grows at a rate totally absurd compared to the spec atlas, right? And I guess that's what you would expect because you're summing up values from the spec atlas into the diffuse atlas. Um, but I guess what I would say is There's still some unanswered questions there that I think we need to start tracking down. Um, so first of all, it does look like, you know, like I was thinking, so starting the lighting quality pass and working on what that diffuse blur should actually do is going to be pretty critical because it, it definitely grows way too quickly um, with the, the spec lighting input. So that's unsurprising. But I think the other thing we need to do is, so if we just take a look just at the spec atlas here um, to go back to the previous debugging step because I, I, I want to track this down I just don't know where that up side lighting is coming from so when we look here you know and we see this like really clear bias up towards all this like apparent lighting that is coming from the sky right um, <clears throat> what what is going on so maybe we can step into this particular uh lighting calculation and take a look at what's coming back you know um another thing we could do is turn off the gather from from outs like don't do them uh and see just to see whether that's the primary thing that's causing us uh getting too much feedback you know uh, which would give us some some like clues basically to what's happening. So if we take a look in um, in the raycaster here, where we go grid raycast, and we come out and here's where we're actually doing uh, our transfer computations. So what you can see here is we do this no matter what. So we're going to compute voxel radiance no matter what happens here, right? Um, what I'm imagining is probably happening is something along the lines of like the diffuse and spec atlases like somehow have bright 
stuff at the apron. So when we hit the apron, we record a bright light coming back that isn't there or something, you know? Um, you know, or something like this. I don't know. I'm not sure. Uh, that's a, that's a tough one. But what I can do here is I can predicate this if we want to, where if we take the transfer PPS values, um, which at the moment are always being written, what I can do instead is I can make it so that we don't write them in the case where we didn't hit. So if we look here and we say, <clears throat> if the probe, uh, So if, if we come out of here and we don't actually think we hit anything, um, and I'm not sure that we ever really record that information, so you can see like something hit uh, would be the thing that would tell us that, uh, whether we ever actually hit. And, you know, at the moment anyway, we never really record that information, but we easily could. So you could imagine, you know, doing this, right? Uh, and it's the exact same loop now. There's no difference between the two. Um, but it also, because uh, basically the first time this becomes true, we exit out. So it doesn't matter that it persists. So we could look at it after the fact, right? So when we break out of this loop um, for a particular ray, oh, oops, and I did put it slightly too high? No, I didn't put it in the right place. So when we break out of this loop, we could just check to see and say, look, you know, if something was hit, you can do this. Otherwise, don't. Right. So that's going to stop anything but an actual legitimate raycast from actually producing uh, color transfer. And so now if I look at it, I just want to look and see what I'm actually going to see uh, with, with these values, right? Um, and what you can see here is it's, it's still completely screwed, right? You can see what looks like reasonable lighting results in a sense. Um, but they're just totally the wrong direction, right? Um, there, there's like no, there's no sense in that at all. Uh, the, the spec map is overwhelmingly getting light uh, from a place that doesn't actually exist. There is no light up there at all. Right? So how is it getting that? And again, this is only, this is, very specifically when it does hit something, not when it doesn't hit something. So now let's try the opposite. Uh, now let's try disallowing hits, right? And this should produce no light, right? I don't think there should be any way to actually get light into this system. So no matter how many times I hit F9 to step the lighting, we should see nothing, right? So that's good. It doesn't really give us much information, but it at least tells us like, oh, okay, like we're not doing something totally crazy here. All right. So we've got some serious issues going on here. And it does look like we're getting false reports of hits and well, that's not true we're either generating false hit reports or we're miswriting the direction in a way that we don't currently know how to look at, right? Like I tried to do a little bit of verification that the place that the spec texel values were being written back was correct. Now, there is another possibility, which is that when we're actually you know, in doing the um, 
doing the right back. So in uh, the internal lighting core, uh, after we call, well, after we call the internal lighting core, So this routine, debug draw cathedral values, this routine could be the thing that's wrong, right? I mean, it could be that we're drawing the values erroneously somehow. So like the ty and tx that we're asking for, we're somehow pulling the wrong value out. So, you know, it's possible, um, but I don't know. I think that's gonna take some doing to like actually kind of look into this particular piece of code where we pass the spec texels here. Um, you know, I could try to sort of verify that that code was correct. If we look when we step through the rows of the spec atlas, um, we're just looking at the one tile that we're on and we're stepping to one and then one plus the row. That is where we would expect to start, right? And then five and one plus the row, which is where we would expect the next one to be. And those both seem totally reasonable. Like that's what you would expect, right? And then the sample dir has to be updated uh, but it just, I don't see what's wrong with that. It looks roughly correct to me. <clears throat> so yeah, I just don't, I just don't see. I don't quite see how that's wrong. <clears throat> so since we drew these and they looked correct the yeah the only possibilities are that the drawing code is somehow not correct meaning we think we drew it and we didn't really or somehow when you actually call this, it's slightly, it's subtly different in a way that we're not picking up, right? Um, <clears throat> but I, I'm sorry, I just don't see it. I don't see it yet. And What, yeah, like what, what would be, what, what could possibly be causing that scenario to occur? Because as far as I can tell, you know, we looked at the Raycaster, it looks like it's doing the correct casting, and I mean, especially with the if something hit part on, um, I think we even verified that it's not even. Yeah, I mean, let's let's take a look. So, <clears throat> let's take this here and color it based on whether it thinks something was hit or not, so we can see whether it early outed. Right. Um, again, don't expect to learn much from this, but it's just another piece of information because I'm not really sure what to look for. Uh, I just kind of need to guess. Um, so, in the, well, I guess in this case, we already sort of did the test, now I think about it. If something hit, if we use the something hit version uh, and we're running it, uh, then when we look at that guy, it just won't draw, right? Yeah, I mean, it just doesn't draw. So we know that it doesn't think that's a hit, right? We already know that. Um, why are we getting multiple ray casts here? Uh, 
Oh, I know why. It's because we're not turning debugging off in that case. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's a real puzzler. Um, I'm going to put this outside for now. Like so. And then I'm looking at. So I guess if I want to test this now, I want to see, I guess I want to pick, you know, maybe like the one next to me, this one right here, and look at that direction, that it, it seems to think that it's getting lighting that way, right? Um, and again, it's a little tough, to be completely honest with you, it's a little tough to necessarily call some of these wrong because the octahedral map is actually fairly sparse. And you know, technically, if I was looking at say, you know, this one right here, that could have come from that light. Right, those would have probably been in the same uh, spec map region. What doesn't make any sense is, for example, you look in here, I mean, so, so maybe what I should be doing is looking at like that. Because, you know, I, I should be seeing, this should, should be where we're getting the light from, like this right here, right? Like all of these should be coming from over there. You know what I mean? Um, at least. So if I shift my my guy over here, and I wonder, yeah, I wonder if there's some easy way I could do a box pick on that. I just it wouldn't take very long. Um, our debug system is just really crappy. It's too bad. Um, anyway, uh, maybe I can just take a look at what happens. Uh, am I going the wrong way on this? I am. So like maybe I can take a look at what happens from right here and see why, you know, like I can't I'm why I'm not hitting uh you know, this light. There. So 177.88, uh, and that's in, um, that's in the init. So, oops, in, nope. So in the init, I want 177.88. And then I want to cast like towards the light. Let me restart that real quick because there's too many, <laughs> too many lines being drawn. I can't see. So I just want to pick a ray that goes to the light source now and I want to see what the heck is going on because like why aren't we getting strong light coming back from the light source, right? Like why why are we not hitting that light source ever? Apparently. Let's start down at the lower
Is that hitting? Nope. Oh man, so close. Doesn't seem like I'm really ever getting there. Let's try that one more time. I mean, I guess it's possible that they're just, it never quite picks a redirection that can hit. That would be unfortunate. and might mean that we don't have a dense enough sampling of the sphere over time but I mean that's sort of a separate issue because we are picking up a ton of light so the question is if we're never hitting a light source how are we doing that god it's like so close I should just move the light upwards slightly you know um, I should just move the light upwards slightly so that I don't have to keep picking so that was 159 That one, like, kind of goes through it, but it's just on the edge. I'm going to go in um, for my own benefit and say, I wonder if I can, for the debug raycaster, I'm not sure I actually need to, um, I'm not sure that I actually need to only run that in the one place that it's being run. Like I could run that at the push. Well, no, but it hasn't actually done anything. So yeah, I, I kind of do have to. So what I could do is just like, in the build diffuse light maps, I could turn that back to one for the moment while I try to find the thing that hits the light source so that we're not getting those so many light things. I could also clamp the total length of those things because I guess we don't need to see that. We just need to know that it's wrong. That's probably what I should do actually now I think about it. So I have no idea what would be a more efficient way of of debugging this short of like stopping and like writing an actually fairly complete debug system for picking these things. <clears throat> okay, there it is. Um, so there's a direct hit on the light source. Um, 325, right? So 325, um, I can in remember that cast here. So send 88, 325. And now we should have a stable debug scenario where uh, when we run this, I can look specifically at what happens with that cast, right? Did I not recompile this? I didn't. Nope, I just didn't type it in. So what I'm going to do is assume, I guess I'll save this uh, for next time, but what I'm going to do is just now step through the code and find out, you know, where is that getting written in the spec map, right? Because you can see that's a hit, right? So we should be able to loop through and watch that get hit. And why is that not producing a light spike in that direction? Because it's definitely not, right? As we watch uh, the spec map propagate, we never see a light in that direction for whatever reason. Um, 
and we don't have an explanation for that, like at all, right? Uh, so something's up, and we don't know what. But yeah, we should be seeing that grow as this sample picks up, but you know that's not really what we're seeing. So I might call it there for today because we probably have a lot of more debugging to do. Uh, I would like to do one more thing before we exit. Someone had asked on the GitHub, um, I guess the floating point mask. So the when we did this to get rid of any denormals, we have this set default FP behavior, right? Um, when we did this, I guess control mask in that way that both Windows and Linux are absolutely horrible about uh, H files. Apparently X Windows just defines something called control mask, not X11 control mask, not X underscore control mask, not underscore control mask, just control mask. Uh, because they were like, we don't care about you. You should just use, you should just only use names we let you use and control mask isn't one of them. So apparently we shouldn't use this uh, because people who compiled on Linux, you know, just had problems with it. So we can change it to something else like that. Um, and again, that doesn't change the code at all. It just makes it so that X11's crappy header files won't screw us up, right? <clears throat> so, uh, Oh, and Uplink Coder had a good suggestion. I just happened again, so I assume we should probably do this as well. Uh, and the suggestion was to only have one light source. And I totally agree with that. Um, we should do that while we're, that's another thing we can do that's really easy. Uh, because then we don't have to worry about where things are hitting light sources potentially. So what I could do is say, yeah, okay. Um, maybe we'll just use the debug light source. So what we'll do is we'll go in here and say, um, uh, when we generate the room, we, we won't actually, so those lamps like that we put in there, um, we won't actually put the, uh, the lights on those lamps. So these um, I can just get rid of, right? So now when we run, there's like literally only just that one light, you know? Um, and I can go back to the uh, build diffuse uh, light maps now, to be fair, there's still multiple lights. There's there's lights on the enemies, but they're not in the world right now. Like like we haven't hopped to where they are, so they shouldn't even be in the entity system. So hopefully that wouldn't cause any problems uh, because the lighting system can't actually access those. Um, so if we do let it grow the fast way, um, just as a quick check to see what information we get out of it, um, we can now run it and we now know that any light that's coming from the system should be coming from this light. It's the only one there is. Um, so here's the results. And again, exactly like I said, it's, um, it's nonsensical, right? Uh, all of the lights are coming from this direction out here uh, when they all should be coming from this direction over here. So we've, you know, we've got some fundamental bug uh, with how we're lining up directions. And if you'll recall, I've said this dozens of times on Handmade Hero now, but I'll say it one more time. All of these languages, like the people keep talking about, like Rust or whatever, they're all designed for catching errors that are so asinine and uninteresting to me because they never take any of my time. And they offer me literally nothing for actually debugging hard problems or writing code that doesn't have those. Indexing, like lining up indices and where things are, that is where 90% of my bugs come from. And I don't know for sure that what we're looking at here is an indexing bug, but I bet you dollars to donuts that it probably is. And I really wish people would stop thinking that like, you know, accidentally using a output parameter as an input parameter or vice versa or something was like where programming it needs like where we need to focus all our time or like forgetting which part of the code owns what memory block it's like these are things that like take none of my time by comparison to stuff like this which takes all of my time 
And like, it's just weird. It's like we spend all of this language development opportunity just dealing, trying to make, trying to eliminate bugs that only programmers I wouldn't want on my team make anyway. And like, I wish at least somebody, and maybe John is the person who's doing this, right? I wish we would spend more time making languages that don't have the kinds of bugs that advanced programmers make, right? Like, what are the what are the, the people who really program a lot and know what they're doing? They still have a ton of bugs. It's not like I don't have a ton of bugs. Could somebody please take a second and make a language that tries to eliminate the kind of bugs that I have, not the kind of bugs that, you know, people who ha- haven't don't even understand what uh, what like allocating memory does, like who have never actually called virtual alloc like i don't really care about that there's so many languages for those kinds of programmers why is that the only thing anyone makes you know so like i'm pretty sure this is probably just an index problem it's probably just a problem because there's so many indices right we are trying to like create voxels at different scales we're trying to create maps for the light that we store and there's so many indices and they're really hard to get right. Um, and I feel like that's almost certainly what we're seeing here, right? Like we are probably doing something where we think we're recording light that's coming from here, but we're actually saying that it's coming from there, you know? Um, I mean, it could be something else, but I bet that's what it is. You know, I bet that's what it is. Because it sure does look like that is an overwhelmingly biased light field. It is all shooting, you know, directly in that direction. And so you imagine if all of those were actually pointing this way, you'd actually just think it was right. You know what I mean? So it does seem like there is some ray casting going on, but it seems like totally busted. What I will say is how the heck are these guys getting those lights? I guess they're getting them by hitting the ground and then interpolating from these, right? Uh, which is a problem we're always gonna have with this kind of scheme. And fortunately for this game, I don't think we have to care about it too much uh, cause it'll probably be fine once we work it out. But even so, right, you can, you can tell that's just totally busted, like, um, cause all of these should be going kind of the opposite direction. All right. So we'll go to brief Q and a. Yeah, I agree with trying to move the light. Uh, it would give us some some limited information so we could see like what the actual, uh, you know, what the actual transform was on it. So for example, if we know uh, that we're getting light that goes in, uh, if we know that we're getting light that goes in that direction, and then we just take the debug light and move it to the side, right? So we could go into the world mode. And we look at the debug light, right? Um, so here, I can just add like a bunch of X to it, right? Now the problem is I have to keep it in bounds because I can't move it outside of the lighting system entirely, but I can just like uh, slide it off to the side um, so now, you know, if you look at where the, the debug light is, uh, it should be, I guess that was too far because I don't see it anymore. Right. Oh, is it just, is it just embedded in some geometry? Looks like it's just over there. Maybe. Maybe. 
So that's just getting, that's just still, well, I guess, you know what? It, it did shear somewhat this direction. Let's see if by pulling it back, we can shear it the other direction, right? So let's suppose we set it this way. And again, I don't know if it's still in bounds, but let's see if we bend it to the, to the right there. Huh, so no, it's but it did change direction, right? So actually moving it this way slid things that way. And again, the octahedral map is packed in a sort of odd way, right? So you can imagine like that being the case. What I would say too though is there's there's more here than just that because this also seems erroneous in other ways because how would you be hitting this light from here at all? Like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Maybe it's interpolated from here, but that's a bit of a stretch, right? Um, so I don't know. So I feel like there's some deeper problem going on there um, than just maybe that it's, uh, that it's incorrectly placed. Like, I think there's maybe, you know, a little bit, yeah, a little bit deeper. I don't know. I'm not convinced that it's as simple as that, right? Um, let's see. Why are there two lit areas in the map with only one light source? Um, well, first of all, the lighting is buggy right now. That's what we're working on. So part of it might be that, but I don't know that there really are though. If you're talking about that, uh, that's just because that's just the, the, the graphics card is not being told to do anything when the lighting sample area is out of bounds. So this is the only place you'd be able to see in the game. This just tiles throughout the universe. So you'd just see there'd be another one over here, another one over here, right? But you can never see over there. And by the time we move over there, uh, you know, we will have updated things. Now, of course, the lighting system is frozen in place. But by the time we actually are looking at this area, then if we started to run it, you can see that it would, you know, actually only be doing the lighting for this region. And then you would see that region is copied, you know, around. So that's just actually because we don't, we only simulate lighting at the area that you're looking at. And if you look at in the debug mode, you can see stuff that's kind of uh, further than that. And that's where that comes from. Um, so I don't think we have any bugs actually that have to do with that. So I think that's, if that's what you're talking about, that's, that's all that is. The bug that we have at the moment is for the grid-based ray casting. We just don't seem to have any real coherence in what the map's actually producing, which is a little bit odd. Um, and I'm not sure. One thing that occurred to me just now that I hadn't thought of before is since we can use the lighting grid, if we, uh, since we can not use the lighting grid, I wonder what happens if we just use the AABB test or uh, instead, because that would let us debug the debug drawing, which could also be wrong, right? So if we do this, which is a correct lighting, well, correct. Okay, so basically our debug drawing is wrong, right? Because look, this is the correct lighting, right? This is what we would expect to see. And then we come out here and we can do stuff and... And yeah, so using the eight, you know, if we don't use the grid, we get reasonable lighting and those things are in the wrong place. Uh, let me actually go to the world mode here real quick and turn off the, um, uh, the F9 key press. So let's just say uh, that it's always updating. So if we set it to always updating and now we run, um, we should be able to like tune, I don't know why I didn't think of this before. We should be able to tune our debug lighting here so that we actually see this doing the correct thing as we move uh, throughout the world, 
right? Um, and so let's just see what did we screw up. Uh, so that that was excellent. I don't know why I didn't think of that before. Um, so if I look at debug uh, draw octahedral values here, this is doing something dumb. The question is what? So here it is doing the center. We assume that's correct because we don't really, we probably aren't looking at the wrong place. I don't know. I don't think we are. Um, and then we're just looping over the TXTY values and asking this to draw them. So presumably if there's a bug, it's in here, presumably. If I go over to debug draw color here uh, and we look at what we're passing, right? Uh, oops. And we look at the indices, we say, okay, I wanna get the tile unclamped for the XYZ TXTY. That could obviously be wrong. So we wanna look at that. Um, and we also have the direction from TXTY and that could also be wrong, right? The rest of this is pretty straightforward and probably couldn't produce a directional change. So let's take a look at direction from TXTY. Uh, that just wants the OXY coefficient. We don't know necessarily that this is right, I guess. Um, I guess we should probably try to test it more thoroughly. I mean, I guess we can do that. Um, I thought we did though, but uh, we could test it more thoroughly, but we are passing the OXY co coefficient, which is the only real requirement. And then we have the TX and TY there. They are offset by one properly, which is what we're seeing here. Um, so it doesn't seem weird. If I go to get tile unclamped, which is another story altogether, um, in in get tile unclamped, you can see I've got the uh, X, Y, and Z coming in here, which I check to make sure it's not out of bounds, which seems good. Uh, we then take the TX and the TY, and we go to grab those by getting light access te texels, computing the offset from them, right? Uh, and then returning that value. Now the light atlas offset, I suppose could itself be wrong. Like this could be wrong, I guess. Um, but it doesn't seem likely. So it's, It's kind of got to be sort of correct in the sense that it's definitive, though. Like, so I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's being used for everything anyway, so I'm not sure that we could have really had much of a bug with it. So it's kind of confusing. I don't know. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, at least we now know though that this this is to blame, but it could be that we've got a bug in direction from TXTY. And if we did, that would also mean that there's problems with our generator as well, uh, which could be important um, because I believe that that gets used. Uh, so in the H8 sphere, right? So when we actually do the um, generate octahedral lighting pattern, we use direction from TXTY. Now, what I would assume direction, that's in the debug, that's in debug. That is in a routine we haven't verified, right? So I guess what I would say is this is highly suspect, right? 
So I wonder if our direction from txty code is actually wrong. Because if it was, that would make a lot of sense, right? Because then we also would have directional errors in our sampler only in the grid raycaster and not in the AABB because the AABB doesn't use a table that builds that, does it? Or, well, no, it does. Never mind. So they both use that. Um, so they both do use that. So I guess that's not as suspicious. I was going to say I thought it was only in those places. So I don't know. I don't know. That's that's pretty confusing to me. Uh, I don't immediately see what the problem is there, and uh, like I said, I might I might save this till next time because it looks like I have to uh, uh, to move in move into it right. Um. So yeah. I would like to see what direction it, it is going. Yeah, and and like and like if you look at it, it's pretty bizarre too because it doesn't seem to be super obvious what the transform between the two are, which I guess is what you'd expect with an octahedral map, because an octahedral map is kind of a somewhat difficult to immediately intuit packing. I mean, it's easy to see how it's packed, but your brain doesn't necessarily unwrap things octahedrally very quickly. But like you can see here, right, if I move around, let me, let me go maybe to an area where I can move around more freely where there aren't as many walls. Um, so here, if I kind of look at the way this is going, like what? It just doesn't make any sense. It's really, really strange. So it's like, it does seem just totally broken because like, why would it, why would I suddenly be getting a bunch of light showing up over here, right? Which, by the way, I'm not seeing. So, like, if you look, I'm not actually seeing it there. So, I don't know. Is is it possible that the X, Y, Zs are wrong somehow that are input to this? Like, I mean, I don't know. That's the only thing I can think of that would be, like, kind of in that same general ballpark, right? Like, I got, like I'm like, no, well, I don't know. Um, debug. There we go. So I guess I don't quite know. Um, it's pretty difficult to it's pretty difficult to guess. I don't actually know. I think I'm gonna need more time, like I said. So I'm probably gonna call it there, and and we'll take a look. But you know, yeah, like this. We could re-enable, we had some assertions in here too, I think, I don't think we use them anymore, but we could um, let the Light Atlas asserts, like, you know, check our bounds again, but I don't actually think we're picking things that are out of bounds. We're probably just picking things that are wrong, would be, you know, my guess. I don't know though. Um, like, you know, for, I could see us like passing X, Y's and Z's in the wrong order or something like that. Um, uh, I don't know. Um, it, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's tough to say, but I guess what I would say here is like the, we could re-enable this assert. So we could just say, look, you know, it's light Atlas assert, or I guess I could do it like this. Oops. Uh, and that would just force it to actually do an assertion there. Um, ooh, just in case, I mean, like I said, I don't think we'd actually get one. Uh, yeah, we don't. 
Um, but uh, yeah, I just think it's going to take too long. So I think I'll save that for next time. But at least we kind of know, like, all right, so our debug drawing was wrong. And that means, like, some of our routines are wrong. So we can go try to verify some of those routines. And it actually wouldn't be hard to make something that was, like, a, uh, a unit test of just those two math routines, right? So while there's really no way we can test the lighting system with a test that would really work, um, we could test just the octahedral indexing in and out uh, and try to bulletproof that a little bit. So there are some things we could do there, and maybe that's like a, a good next step, for example. All right. Push debug line parameter order. Hmm. You know what? That's not a bad suggestion. I don't. I don't know that we. It seems unlikely, but yeah, you know. Could be. Um. So if I go to debug draw color dir, you know, maybe it is. That would be great. But yeah, it's it's not. Right, because the, the color is the last value, and you know, here's the center peep and the center P plus scale intensity dir. So, you know, it's a bummer, right? But it's all right. Let's see if there are any other suggestions before we sign off. Direction inverted. Um, it doesn't look like it's inverted to me. Does it look like it's inverted to you? Um, because if it was inverted, I would expect to see it counter rotate with me. You know, like if I move over here, I'd expect to see it start going that way, but it's, it's really not doing that. Um, And oddly enough, it seems to like, you know, it, it, it's weird. It, it's it's just very strange. I'm not sure what, I'm not really sure what's going on here. It's very bizarre. But at least we have a visualization that we uh, can now align to an actual version that's, that's roughly working. Um, so we should be able to debug this and get this to the point where whatever the weird thing is that we obviously screwed up... Um, It just, yeah, it just looks weird. And if you look at what's going on here too, you know, it's like, I don't understand. Like, you know, it's, it's it's just very contrary to what you would expect, right? Like I'd expect to be seeing it coming down here, you know, I don't know. It's very odd. It's not right. Um, I don't know how direction TX from TY, how direction from TX to TY could be wrong though. <sighs> Um, uh, I don't know. Does this not pass through the thing we did for having the 3D texture? Um, oh, I see. No, uh, we don't tilt the line in the shader. These lines are just drawn directly, as far as I know. So yeah, I don't know. I think we're just gonna have to spend another 
serious debug session on it, which is fair. Like I said, it's very complicated code, so it's going to take a while uh, to get to, but we'll get there. Um, you can always break it down into smaller pieces and, and test those pieces. So, all right. Thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's my pleasure coding with you as always. If you would like to follow along with the series at home, you can always pre-order the game at handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code so you can follow along with it. Um, assuming that my voice isn't having troubles as it has been, uh, I will be back here next weekend. If it is, I might take some time off to let it rest. Uh, we'll see. Uh, nobody seems to really quite know what's wrong with it, so I'm not sure uh, how to give a forecast on it. But that's it for today. Uh, I will see you all back here next weekend, assuming all goes well. And until then, have fun programming. I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody. <laughs>